Hello, everybody. Wow. <clears throat> so, I just um, read the first four chapters here of Dracula. <clears throat> and I feel like there is so much to say. Like, if you're like me, you've read this book a few times, and you've seen... <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> you've seen adaptations of this many, many times. And, um... I, there are certain things that I always um, come to with this book. And um, a lot of it is the way it's written. But um, beyond that, there are some things about this book that are just so fucking clever. And uh, I think what it is is that you come into it with certain expectations, especially a book like this that um, is like almost legend, you know, like everyone's heard of this book. And a lot of people constantly think of Bella Lugosi when they read this book. And I think the Bram Stoker's Dracula film with um, Gary Oldman playing Dracula probably, in my opinion, especially at the beginning, um, probably did the best to show the difference between how Jonathan Harker met, the Dracula Jonathan Harker met, to the Dracula that ended up in London. And, um, but even there, like, you miss so much, because I think there they kind of went overboard a little bit on it. But, um, so right now we're going to talk about the first four chapters of Dracula, which are um, Jonathan Harker's journal. And uh, one of the interesting things about this, and we'll start from the first chapter, is that the idea of his journal kind of being like a travel log for himself is... Um, kind of quaint, you know, and like someone today who doesn't understand that people used to do this all the time, like they would go on trips and write pages and pages of the things they saw, the countryside, the people, um, any kind of lore of the area, um, just as one would take a picture for Instagram nowadays, you know. Um, it was very matter-of-fact if you had the ability to do those things, if you had the ability to write and, um, you know, be able to do this shit. But I think what's cool about this is how... His travel log turns into the nightmares that he has during this time. Um, it gets a little more personal, a little more terrifying. Um, and I think that helps kind of, it helps the horror aspect of the book. Um, but other things that are just really quaint and cute are like, um, he makes a memorandum to remember to ask somebody for the recipe of the food he had. And honestly, I don't know if he ever did. Um, but the other thing about this that makes it a bit 
like, eh, is like you have to trust your narrator, okay? And your narrator is writing a journal. And in his journal, he is doing like um, word for word um, conversations that he's having. And again, this is conversations that are going to be based on his memory and then his bias. And so if anyone is reading this from a sense that this could be true, which obviously it's not, but um, you immediately have to start questioning it because like... <clears throat> I don't know, can you think of anybody who writes a memoir and has, like, full-on conversations with people and remembers, like, word for word everything that the people said in those conversations? It's kind of... To me, it kind of pulls me out of it. But I will say <clears throat> um, that... I think the way he uh, portrays Dracula in these opening chapters is amazing. Um, and we'll get into that more in a minute. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that you don't think about when you read this book compared to watching all the film adaptations is that the driver <clears throat> from the Borgo Pass is so fucking talkative to him. And um, you don't really get that in any adaptation of this um, story. Um, and then the other thing is that I think the Bargo Pass stuff in this book is seriously so good. And it's put in such a beautiful place because it's kind of the first time shit gets real and the the pacing of the horror in this book is actually really fucking good um like the Borgo Pass scene and him riding with the driver to Castle Dracula like that could be its own fucking movie like that was just fucking amazing. And the other thing I really like about this is um, it's kind of like all the Chekhov's guns kind of thing. <clears throat> the driver keeps seeing these blue flames in the woods <clears throat> and abruptly stops the carriage and runs out into the woods. Um, and he doesn't know why. And then the driver will just come back and then they will continue on their journey and um, he eventually finds out like why this is later on and it turns out that um, on one night every year um, which May the 4th is that night which is funny because everyone should start reading Dracula on May the 4th that's just hysterical um, we, could, we could show those Star Wars jerks what's up um but anyway, um, he finds out that on that night, um, flames appear, blue flames appear, where people have buried treasure. And um, later in these first four chapters, he finds piles and piles of gold um, in the room where Dracula is supposed to be um, living. And it's all gold from, like, all these different... Um, countries and none of it is um like all of it's older than 300 years old like 300 years old was like the newest bit of gold he found and um it's just it's nice how all of these like pieces are put together um <clears throat> the other thing about his interaction with Dracula especially early on is how charming Dracula is. And, like, some of you are like, well, of course he's a vampire, you dumbass. No, but just, like, the dialogue. It's not creepy. Like, I didn't find anything he said creepy. 
um, at least in the first couple chapters, and his love for England seems really fucking sincere. And um, all that just works so well. And then when we get to the part where um, he <clears throat> talks about um, the history of his family and the history of Transylvania and all that stuff and how passionate he gets, um, it's, it's really fucking cool. And um, then we have the shit with the brides... Um, and that's one of those things where you're like, it's written really well. Like the, um, idea that it's kind of a turn on, but at the same time kind of revolting. And then when he, when Dracula shows up and the chicks are like, like, what are we going to eat? And he fucking throws a bag on the ground and he could see that something's moving in the bag and then they open the bag and he hears like what he thinks is a child cry and the women gasp and um, then later um, a mother comes up screaming and wailing at the castle and um, saying she wants her baby back and then um, wolves eat her it's like shit like this is fucking getting brutal um and then there's like some shit that makes you you kind of feel for Jonathan but I don't know it's like I've always felt that Jonathan Harker was quite the wet fart if that makes sense um he as a protagonist, even though it's only in these first four chapters, like, you, you want to, like, cheer for your fucking protagonist, you know, you want him to succeed, and, um, he is so blah, and, um, it just makes it hard for you to want to see him like succeed out of this situation but the horrors are so kind of visceral that you kind of don't give a shit um and that is a trope that I think um has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse as um horror has gone on to the point where um, nobody gives a shit if anyone lives or dies in horror, and then you get to the point where people are actually cheering the murderers, you know? And um, it's like... Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so Dracula's like, okay, check this out. I need you to um, write and post date a bunch of letters saying that you're okay. And he's like, Fuck. He's like, I'm totally fucked here. And, um, I don't want to give too much away, but, like, the the climbing down the walls is fucking great. I don't like the fact that he also can do it. Because it seemed like when Dracula did it, it was, like, supernatural. But now that he can do it, it just seems like... Uh... Like, that wasn't really that cool of a trick, was it? Um, let me see. Is there anything else that I really wanted to hit here? Um, I think the um, the idea of him knowing, like, the date of his demise because he knows when the letters are going to be post-dated. And then um, the fact that his journal entries are going... Um, further into June it's like um, he's like get, it's like a what? what's that um, not the time bomb is it the time bomb idea of writing a story 
that you only have so much time to get to what you need to get to. <clears throat> and so the reader knows that there is a definite end. And so you're like racing against the clock. So it kind of has that feel to it. Um, the bit about um, him wanting to leave the night before and how Dracula pulls that off and he's like, yeah, okay, go ahead. Knock yourself out, you know. Um, that's fucking brilliant. Um, and then we get this bit where he finally um, finds Dracula in a coffin and he opens it and he sees that he's super young and like bloated and has like blood all down his mouth and um, his eyes are open but he's not conscious and he's like I gotta kill him I can't let this guy get to England and he looks around and he finds a shovel and then he like swings the shovel down at his head <clears throat> and his head just like slightly moved and um, it terrified him and like he gashed Dracula's forehead or whatever and um, the lid fell shut and like that that's it and then he hears the slow box coming to um, get the rest of the things to ship to England and he's worried that if he doesn't get out of there like even if he has to like scale the walls down um, that the women are going to fucking devour him now the Dracula's not there to protect him so um, it, it's it's so interesting and I'm gonna keep reading now because I'm like totally excited about it but um, fuck but now here's the thing that makes Dracula a strange book because now we're getting different point of view characters from different um, epistolary means and um, every time I've read this book this is when a lot of my interest in the book starts to wane because um, I was all into it getting to know a character and all this stuff and now we start back at zero with a new character learning all about Dracula and then we're going to start at zero with another character and learn all about Dracula and it's like well we've already learned all about Dracula he's fucking terrifying so um, this is now boring for us so hopefully um, the the fate of this uh, doesn't happen again but um, I hope you're enjoying it let me know down below what you think um, if you're following along um, let me um, take a look at my notes here um, so maybe on the 6th I'll post um, another video or maybe I'll do one tomorrow I don't know I'm trying to get the property down in the desert all taken care of and cleaned up and it's kind of a fucking nightmare um, and um, it's kind of emotional guys it's making my heart hurt a little bit so um, yeah I'll either uh, I'll either do one tomorrow or I'll do one on the 6th Okay, so that's that's the deal. I'm trying to keep all of the um, point of views together when I do these videos because this one here was an amazing, exciting ride with Jonathan Harker. Um, and next, we're going to be um, dealing with Miss Mina Murray um, for the next couple. Um... Yeah, so that, that's it. So um, let me know what you think down below, and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.